After CoffeeZilla came out with a three-part expose about Logan Paul on the subject of scamming his fans for the crypto project CryptoZoo, Logan Paul decided to respond with a couple videos of his own, in both of which he forcefully threatened to sue CoffeeZilla. Uh, if not, we're going to handle this ourselves while we continue to build CryptoZoo, and I'll see you in court. Part six is the more he says and the more he continues to spread this misinformation that this was any sort of con or scam, the more I have for the lawsuit that I am filing. The defamation lawsuit that is fucking happening because this is wrong. This is fucking wrong. In this video, we're talking about what's happened since, as well as a bunch of places where Logan may have made some major legal missteps. Let's get into it. So as a bit of background, if you don't know who Logan Paul is, he's a massive, huge YouTuber who's been around for a very long time and has had his fair share of controversies along the way, some of which were fairly large. Then on the other hand, we have CoffeeZilla, which is a YouTube channel run by a man named Steven. Steven or CoffeeZilla primarily makes content that is focused on exposing scammers and multi-level marketing schemes, things like that. And lately, CoffeeZilla has been absolutely on fire. He started by exposing Sam Bankman Freed and his crypto exchange FTX all the way until SBF got arrested in the Bahamas. He also made an incredible video exposing Andrew Tate's Hustlers Academy months before Tate ever got arrested in Romania for rape and human trafficking. So when a three-part series about Logan Paul by CoffeeZilla appeared on YouTube at the end of last month, I can understand why Logan would freak out. You see, CoffeeZilla worked behind the scenes for about a year investigating Logan Paul's crypto NFT project, CryptoZoo. Here's Logan Paul explaining what CryptoZoo is. CryptoZoo is a blockchain project that I created about a year and a half ago. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should give some context to what the game is. Um, so you, you, you buy these eggs on the blockchain and you can hatch them uh, into, into what are called base animals. Uh, I think there were like 14 or 15 of them. And then you can breed your base animals with each other to create fun looking viral hybrid offspring that have a rarity scale. When you, if you hatch a rare animal and you breed it with another rare animal it, and it yields a rare hybrid animal, that animal then yields and collects a token the longer you hold it. Then when you release it into the wild, you accrue your yield. Mm. Does that make sense? That that was that was the concept. Got it. Anyway, what came out of that investigation was this three-part expose on CryptoZoo being basically a complete scam that had separated a lot of people from millions of their own hard-earned dollars. Today, we're investigating Logan Paul's CryptoZoo, a blockchain game that made millions but never worked. Some of you guys think you know the story, but it goes so much deeper. I've uncovered sociopaths, billionaires, fake orphans. Did I mention fake orphans? And of course, at the center of it, we have Logan Paul himself who has abandoned this thing, leaving thousands of fake orphans in his wake. Wait a second. Thousands of victims in his wake. Now, you'll be hearing from some of those people because their stories are heartbreaking. Anyway, so following and in response to the three-part series, Logan Paul came out with a video trying to discredit CoffeeZilla and essentially threaten him with defamation. He followed that up with another episode of his Impulsive podcast where he spent a great deal of time talking about the series and talking about CoffeeZilla and again reiterating his plans to sue CoffeeZilla. Hello, it's Future Alita, or... Alita of the present, Alita of the more recent past. Everything you've seen in this video so far has been past Alita. One of the things that's pretty unique to working in this space is the degree to which things can move very quickly, especially when you are covering controversies between two different major YouTube channels. Sometimes even if you jump right onto a trending topic right away, somewhere along the process of scripting, filming, and editing your video all the way up until the upload, things can change very quickly. And when that happens, sometimes you have to go back and sort of change the video a little bit so that it is still relevant to the viewers, hopefully, hopefully still relevant to the viewers. Anyway, that's basically what happened with this video. I was just about ready to come out with a video about all of the legal reasons why Logan Paul's two video reactions were a terrible idea. They still were a bad idea, but the first part of the video really kind of focused on Logan Paul's 
threats of litigation against CoffeeZilla. And at this point in time, CoffeeZilla has since tweeted out that he received a phone call from Logan Paul saying that he was going to be taking down his two response videos and that he was not going to be moving forward with litigation. What's up? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Holmes, you want to hang out? No? Okay. <laughs> Now, I will say this is the best possible decision that Logan could have made at this particular juncture. Oh. Oh, uh, oh hello. Oops. Okay. Hi. Hey, buddy. You have something to say? Okay. Anyway, back to it. <laughs> Where was I? I'm going to go back a little bit. I will say this is the best possible decision that Logan could have made at this particular juncture, because even though he has to take a big public L by essentially losing a game of litigation chicken against CoffeeZilla, moving forward with a defamation case against CoffeeZilla would have been potentially disastrous for Logan Paul, no matter what. Here's past Alita explaining why. If he does decide to move forward and pursue litigation, in my personal opinion, I don't think that he's likely to win a case of defamation against CoffeeZilla for this expose. And that's because in order to win a case of defamation, it's not just about the full story not being told. There are a number of elements that have to be met in order for the plaintiff to win. First, the plaintiff has to show that the defendant lied or made some sort of a misstatement about the plaintiff. Second, the plaintiff has to show that that statement was made to at least one third party. Third, the plaintiff has to make a showing of the requisite intent. I'll get to that in just a second. And fourth, the plaintiff has to show that there's some sort of reputational harm that was done to the plaintiff as a result of the lie or the misstatement. Now, there are certain cases where the plaintiff doesn't actually have to show this last element, the reputational harm element. That is defamation per se. This is where somebody has lied about somebody being a criminal, having an STD, or sometimes about somebody's work or their profession. But going back to that third element, the requisite intent, it depends on who it is the plaintiff is. Where that plaintiff is a private person versus a public figure, then the plaintiff only needs to show that the defendant lied or made the misstatement about them with negligence. That's a fairly low standard and fairly easy to meet. But where we're talking about the plaintiff being a public figure, Logan Paul easily, very easily a public figure here, then he has to show actual malice. Meaning Logan Paul would have to show that not only did CoffeeZilla lie or make some misstatements about him, but that he did so either knowing that what he was saying was false or with reckless disregard as to the truth or falsity of the statement. Now, there are a number of issues with Logan Paul claiming that the video series was somehow defamatory. Number one, his video doesn't actually point out any specific statements that he says are untrue, other than to say that there is more information that CoffeeZilla didn't actually include in his videos. That's not the same thing as saying that something that that CoffeeZilla actually said was actually a false statement. He has to pull out a specific statement to say this was false. The only thing that we can really point to here that he would be saying is false is that Logan Paul is a scammer. So I guess we can just go with that and then continue on with our analysis. But this actual malice standard is something that is going to be a very, very, very high hurdle for Logan Paul to meet. And that's because Part of the beauty of CoffeeZilla's series is he shows his work along the entire way. He talks about the different weaknesses and potential arguments and how he really looks at things from multiple perspectives. Now, I didn't want to just take one person's word for it, so I later confirmed with another developer who worked for something called the Blockchain Center that he also hadn't been paid. Uh, we've been paid nothing. I would have loved to have Zoo, but I don't have any. He talks to a number of individuals, including another journalist who has previously investigated Eddie Ibanez, one of the other members of the CryptoZoo team. I wasn't quite sure what to make of him. Based on what I knew about him, he was a MIT grad who went on to work for the CIA and the Defense Department, and I didn't want to waste his time. And it wasn't long after I sat down that I realized he was wasting my time. Can you tell me about some of the lies Eddie told you? Eddie has told me so many lies over the course of my two interviews with him. And the first lie he told me is probably the oldest lie 
that he's told so many people, which is that he's an orphan. So by showing his work along the way, Coffeezilla really has immunized himself quite a bit from any potential defamation liability here, especially because we're talking about actual malice. It's really hard to look at everything that he did in all of these videos and to say that he was being reckless about the truth or falsity here. It looks actually like he was being quite careful in, in pulling on all kinds of different threads and looking at things from multiple perspectives. So in my personal opinion, I think that it would be a fool's errand for Logan Paul to go down this route to sue CoffeeZilla for defamation because I really don't think that that's a case that he would really be likely to win anyway. But even before we get to the point of proving or disproving the defamation, CoffeeZilla really actually has a couple options here if faced with a complaint. And those options are between filing an anti-slap motion or allowing the litigation to proceed. So first let's talk about anti-slap. So anti-slap comes from slap, which means strategic litigation against public participation. It's basically a mechanism for removing very quickly litigation that is aimed towards trying to diminish someone's First Amendment rights. In other words, where the lawsuit is basically aimed at trying to prevent someone from doing something that they have a constitutional right to do so. Like, for example, speak freely. Anti-slap motions are filed really early in the litigation, especially in states like Texas and California, where they are very powerful and have a very specific mechanism for freezing the litigation, getting everything kicked out, and ultimately punishing the plaintiff for bringing it in the first place. In an anti-slap inquiry, basically, usually there's a two-step process. First, the court asks whether the conduct that gave rise to the lawsuit is protected by the First Amendment. Examples of conduct that falls under this umbrella would be filing litigation, speaking in a congressional hearing, or speaking on a topic of public interest. In this particular case, CoffeeZilla was talking about influencers potentially scamming their own viewers or their own fans for the purposes of making money off of them. That is arguably a topic of public interest. So if hypothetically we have a defamation lawsuit here and CoffeeZilla decides to file an anti-slap motion, that first prong would be met. But that's not the end of the analysis here. See, then the court would be asking whether or not the plaintiff has a likelihood of success on the merits of their case. And as I already discussed, in my personal opinion, I don't think that if Logan Paul brought a defamation case against CoffeeZilla, he would be likely to win. So this would be a case where CoffeeZilla arguably could have a very successful anti-slap motion, anti-slap process that got rid of this case very, very swiftly with zero expense to him. But like I said, that is one option that CoffeeZilla has if he is served with a complaint for defamation by Logan Paul. You see, CoffeeZilla could actually decide to allow the litigation to move forward. There's nothing compelling him to file an anti-slap motion here. Now, you might be thinking, why in the world would he do that? Who, who wants to have litigation proceed forward when it's expensive, it's scary, it's intimidating, you have to deal with lawyers all the time? It's a huge mess. Well, you have to remember that we are talking about CoffeeZilla here, who spent a year talking to individuals and investigating Logan Paul and CryptoZoo and all of the individuals that were involved in it, talking to people behind the scenes and trying to investigate in various ways and examining the blockchain. He really spent a lot of time and effort really trying to dig into it from an outsider's perspective. But if Logan Paul sues CoffeeZilla for defamation on this particular issue, and CoffeeZilla decides to allow it to proceed, it goes to discovery next. Meaning Logan Paul opens himself up to having to give over all kinds of evidence that is relevant to this particular lawsuit. And when it comes to deciding what kind of information is discoverable or not discoverable, it's not just the information that would tend to prove or disprove the elements of defamation. It's also the evidence that would tend to prove or disprove the defenses that are made by the defendant. And the thing about defamation is that truth of the statement is always an absolute defense 
to the litigation. So in other words, if CoffeeZilla decided to allow it to proceed to discovery, he would have access to any information related to whether or not CryptoZoo is a scam. All of that would be discoverable and Logan Paul would be required under rules of civil litigation to hand that over to CoffeeZilla. And any attempt to say that that's private information, private information is not really likely to hold up because at the end of the day, Logan Paul is the one that brought the litigation in the first place. So he is the one that has opened up the door to all of that information coming out to the other side in the first place. Now, the court may decide to put certain rules on whether or not that information may be disclosed to the public, but by and large, I would expect CoffeeZilla to be able to use a lot of that information for content. So either way, Logan Paul, in my opinion, loses the moment he files a complaint against CoffeeZilla. Okay, so you might be thinking, okay, so that's basically the end of it, right? Logan has decided that he's not moving forward with the litigation. He's taking down the two reaction videos. That's it, right? Well, not so fast. See, there are a number of reasons why those videos were arguably a terrible idea, legally speaking, that doesn't necessarily just go away just because he took those down. Here's past Alita again, explaining why Logan might have some legal issues from those videos. Number one, he says that he learned through CoffeeZilla's series that the people that he had hired were scammers and felons. I don't know what to believe from his stuff and I don't know what not to believe. I, I found out stuff. I found out things watching his series. Like, like, dude, I was at the airport um, when I watched the part where he said Jake's had stolen of course. six- I was like, what? Six million dollars. I don't know if that's true or not, but, but he, we, I knew he was a bad actor, hence why we- kicked him off the fucking team immediately when we found out he was only in it for the His money. prerogatives, yeah. Things fucking fell apart. Not only is this a bad look in terms of the court of public opinion and it makes him look incredibly incompetent as a leader, it also could be enough for investors to really sniff around and possibly pin him for defrauding them. Basically, in the video, he admits that a number of people that were working for him essentially scammed and defrauded all of these people, took off with their money, et cetera, et cetera. Crypto King Jake stole $6 million. True or not, we had already removed him from the team when we realized he was a bad actor and his motives were purely financial. Conman Eddie, lead developer, stole $1.7 million. True or not, when we learned he was a bad actor as well, he was immediately removed from the team. He says, effectively, these guys scammed people. It wasn't me. They just happened to work for me and I was, I made the mistake of relying on them. I guess that's what I get for trusting the team that I relied on to vet and manage Eddie's hiring process, who has turned out to be a professional con man that I have since learned fooled billionaires, the Mormon church, the owner of the New York Yankees, and now me. So it's clear that he's trying to just pass off the blame to these other individuals and to say that he also is a victim and maybe even more of a victim than some of these other victims because he tries to dig up some crap about one of the victims that shows up in the video. But anyway, those statements don't really help him because he basically th is admitting in this video that these people have scammed these other people. He just says that it's not his fault. But him disclaiming fault here it doesn't get him out of liability, potentially from these investors. There's a number of issues here that still lead the responsibility back to Logan. You see, he says that these people were hired by other people. Okay, let's go through the list. The first is the lead developer, who CoffeeZilla refers to as Z, who was apparently hired by Eddie Ibanez. Eddie Ibanez, in turn, I guess, turned out to be a scam artist who said he went to MIT, didn't really go to MIT, said he was an orphan, wasn't really an orphan, and then subsequently absconded with perhaps $1.7 million. So apparently the scam artist is the one who hired the felon to do the main developing on the app, or not the app, the project. And then he just stops the analysis there as if that completely cuts off the responsibility to him. But at the end of the day, if Eddie Ibanez was the one who was deputized to hire the lead developer, Eddie Ibanez was also hired by someone. 
Logan doesn't say who hired Eddie Ibanez, but he does seem to suggest that it wasn't him. But the fact that he doesn't say who hired Eddie indicates that it was someone else close to him and probably someone that he doesn't want to throw under the bus. To me, the only other person who probably would have hired Eddie would have been Logan's manager, Jeff Levin. And judging by the fact that Jeff made an appearance on Logan Paul's most recent podcast, Impulsive, something tells me that the two of them are still quite close. So this tells me that despite the fact that Logan is apparently upset about the fact that Eddie Ibanez turned out to be a scam artist, he's not that upset at whoever it was that hired him, whether it was him or it was Jeff, because both of them are still around and Logan's just angry at CoffeeZilla, apparently. It's like a little gnat. It's like a little fucking annoying gnat and it bothers me. He won, he won, he won, he got to me, bro. He's the, mo- he's the most formidable opponent I've had. I'm not kidding. Guys. But even if Jeff was the one to hire him, at the end of the day, who is Jeff hired by? Logan. And the crux of the matter for this particular issue is the fact that there is something called a cause of action for negligent hiring, where an employer is legally responsible for an employee who harms a third party. This is where an employer knew or should have known about a risk presented by hiring the employee. This is why employers will very often run background checks on new hires. If it turns out that a new hire has something in their background that is particularly risky to either their other coworkers or to their clients or to anybody else to whom they might have contact in their professional work, that's something that could actually be brought all the way up to the employer. And so at the end of the day, if Logan is blaming either the lead developer or Eddie Ibanez for anything having to do with the failure of CryptoZoo, at the end of the day, that's still going to get back to Logan because he should have done what was necessary in order to fulfill a background check on all of these individuals. And it's not like he didn't have access to this particular information. After all, according to CoffeeZilla's video, there was another journalist who was investigating Eddie Ibanez particularly, who actually found the lies that Eddie Ibanez had told about his background and about his resume and brought all that information to Jeff before the CryptoZoo NFTs went live. I found out CryptoZoo did have an advantage that could have saved them all this trouble the whole time. So a month before the launch of CryptoZoo, I got on the phone with Jeff Levin, Logan Paul's manager. And after he spoke fondly of Eddie and his work, I confronted him about some of Eddie's lies, including how he didn't work for the NFL. Jeff told me he doesn't know much about the NFL, but he knows about the business world. And Chris Birch and Todd Morley vouched for Eddie. And so Jeff and Logan were going to continue working with him. Have have you ever verified that anything Eddie said about himself is true? We verified that it's true? Yeah. Yeah, we we definitely talked to people Okay. And, and his friends and, you know, and people that he said he has relationships with, which we've confirmed them for sure. Okay. Because I had trouble with some of that, like, with the NFL, like, saying that, like, no, we've never worked with him and that kind of thing. But but you've had... The NFL, the NFL saying that? Yeah. Like, who at the NFL? The, the comms teams for the Eagles and the uh, Dolphins. And then the um, people specifically that he named that he said he worked with. Got it. Um, I don't know necessarily the football stuff. Okay. You know, I don't have relationships in the football world. Sure. But in the business world, you know, we've definitely, you know, talked to multiple people. Like Todd and Chris, and they backed him. Correct. Wait a second. This means at minimum, Jeff knew about Eddie's background beforehand, or part of it, and still decided to go with it. This is just unbelievable, willful stupidity. And since Jeff is Logan's manager, I assume him and the team should have known about this as well. But still, they went forward with it, even though they knew this stuff before launch. So yeah, a strong argument could probably be made that Jeff, and by extension Logan, because Jeff is Logan's agent after all, he is his manager, he is paid for that particular reason to do certain tasks, to fulfill certain tasks for him, that they had this knowledge about the things that Eddie Ibanez had done that were shady in his past, the lies that he had told, the fact that he didn't have the experience that he said he had, and all of these things were risks to the project and therefore to those third party investors. They had this information going into it and decided not to act on it. 
But on top of that, as if that's not enough, there's something else that struck me while watching Logan Paul's response video to CoffeeZilla's series about him. You see, he throws out a number of allegations about a number of people that just for Logan's sake, I really hope is true because it would be terribly ironic if in a video where he's throwing around the word defamation about CoffeeZilla, if in fact in that very video, he is actually defaming a number of people. First, he leads with th this about CoffeeZilla. You see, CoffeeZilla tried to work with law enforcement in the past, but his work was described as not anchored to truth and often speculative. First off, this part feels awkwardly out of place and makes me think that maybe this was just Logan trying to satisfy his ego in the moment, I like what he did with all of the memefied photos of CoffeeZilla throughout the video. But more importantly, when did that happen? What law enforcement agency is he talking about? Who said that about him? At best, we've got a hearsay statement about CoffeeZilla that isn't backed up with any receipts, so the viewer is supposed to just blindly accept it. And this is a risky tactic when it's coming from someone who is already starting off with his own credibility issues. But at worst, if it's not true, it's potentially defamatory. Now, I am not saying that it is not true. I have no idea about CoffeeZilla's history, any potential history trying to work with law enforcement or working with law enforcement, but the lack of receipts made me question this. But there is also another point here that should be looked at about the statements that Logan makes about CoffeeZilla in this particular video. And that is Logan's assertion that CoffeeZilla is this criminal who broke the law by recording his manager, Jeff, over the phone. And surely a real internet detective would not break criminal and civil laws in trying to get information, right? So why have you allowed the illegal recording of Jeff's phone call without his permission? And then more like an internet criminal, post it online. And it was interesting, it was like, this is wild. So let's talk about that really quick. So I will start off this point by saying that there is a possibility that Logan has a point here. Some states do in fact require that all parties on a recording have to consent to being recorded in order for that to be a lawful recording. But note that this is where they have a reasonable expectation that they would be speaking in privacy. If someone's just having a conversation out on a public courtyard, there's arguably no reasonable expectation of privacy. And so anyone can arguably be recorded uh, in a circumstance like that. But aside from that, it also depends on where the individuals are located when the alleged recording is happening. Regardless of whether Jeff was in California or Puerto Rico, both of these jurisdictions require that all of the parties to the recording give their consent before that be that recording being lawful. Of course, Jeff could have been physically in some other state or outside of the country altogether when that happened, in which case the analysis could possibly change. Texas, on the other hand, which is where CoffeeZilla, I believe, lives, is a single party state, meaning that only one of the parties to the conversation needs to give their consent. So CoffeeZilla would be the one to give the consent. He's the one who's recording after all. And so therefore, from his side, he has a lawful recording. But the thing is that when it comes to courts treating multi-jurisdictional issues like this, usually they are going to go with the most restrictive state. So if Jeff was in California or Puerto Rico and CoffeeZilla was in Texas, the court is going to take whatever state Jeff was in and go with that. But the main question here would be whether or not Jeff had a reasonable expectation of privacy when talking to a journalist who says that he's calling because he's investigating the whole crypto zoo issue, his company, Logan Paul, all of these individuals that were involved. This is arguably a relatively gray area that would involve argument from both sides, but honestly, my gut says probably not. But still, even if CoffeeZilla did in fact violate this law, Logan Paul is also a little bit misleading here about what the penalties are for this. He's highlighted, for example, a $10,000 penalty. But if you actually read the California statute, that is for someone who has already been convicted of that particular crime. Another part of that statute says that the first offense for something like that would be $2,500. Now, of course, that's nothing to sneeze at, but when we're talking about litigation costs, that's really not worth the filing fees. But leading back to Logan throughout the video, calling CoffeeZilla essentially a criminal for, for recording Jeff over the phone, is that potentially defamatory? <sighs> Personally, it makes me uncomfortable because of the fact that CoffeeZilla would have an argument against him as to why, in fact, he doesn't violate any of these statutes because of the fact that that conversation doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, or maybe he, in fact, actually did get permission from Jeff and that just wasn't 
something that showed up in the video. Now, if Logan is wrong about that, is that defamation automatically? Eh, personally, I think that would be a relatively weak case for defamation, but it is still something that Logan is arguably opening himself up to by perpetuating those allegations against CoffeeZilla and doing so very robustly. Now that's CoffeeZilla. Logan makes a number of allegations that he just sort of splashes out there about a number of other people as well. First, I'll mention Emilio. Here's what Logan says about him. And surely you knew Emilio, the gentleman who supposedly let his child invest in a cryptocurrency, was allegedly responsible for two rug pulls before you interviewed him. So either you missed that or you knew it and failed to let the public know. Why? Because it was a clear sign that he was also untrustworthy. First off, objection relevance. What does that have to do with Emilio getting scammed potentially by CryptoZoo and all of the guys that were involved in it? But second, how do we know that that's actually true? How do we know that this Emilio, who has a relatively common first name, to be fair, especially in certain parts of the world, is actually the same guy who performed this rug pull with two other coins in the past? If that's not true, potentially defamatory, of course, with the proper analysis of requisite intent and all that kind of stuff. But that's something that Logan really should be relatively careful of. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe he did his own analysis. Maybe he has all kinds of background information before saying these things. But the the way in which it's been just sort of thrown out there without without real receipts, without any sort of foundation, really dials up my anxiety a little bit on the things that he's saying here. But finally, Logan also throws out a major accusation against the lead developer of CryptoZoo. Specifically, this is what he says. Coffee, you interviewed the developer who stole the game code, fled to Switzerland, and held it hostage for a million dollars. Well, his name is Zach Kelling. Surely, as the internet detective that you proclaim to be, you would know that he spent time in prison for multiple felonies, one for aggravated robbery, armed robbery at a liquor store, and the other for, surprise, obstructing the legal process. I can see why you kept him anonymous. Who will be calling Z here? I guess among many things, it doesn't surprise me that he lied about having 30 engineers and a $50,000 a week burn rate. On my end, I have 30 engineers. I'm burning $50,000 which side note is how this delusionist landed on the million dollar code ransom, but it turns out he only had three engineers. Wouldn't someone with journalistic integrity know their credible source had not only an agenda, but a fondness for orange jumpsuits? Or did you just hear what you wanted to hear and moved on? Because even if you're lying to yourself, Stephen, you still have to believe it. Again, objection relevance. <laughs> also, if this were a court of law, this would not be admissible to try to discredit uh, this developer anyway, because of the fact that the prior crimes are not crimes of dishonesty. But at the same time, how do we know that this Zach Kelling, who is a felon, is the same Zach Kelling as the lead developer for CryptoZoo? There are two things specifically that give me pause here. First, the image that he puts on the screen looks like a basic background search result, but we can't see any way of corroborating whether or not this guy is the same guy as that guy. And so it's relatively unclear to the viewer whether or not that corroboration was done at all. And at the same time, it does look like there is a potential discrepancy in the middle name of this individual, showing that there is not a match between this person and the person that they are searching for information on. It could just be that they didn't have his middle name, I suppose, but still, when you're looking at this as a viewer that is just taking in this information, that's a possible discrepancy that is a possible warning sign. Now, one thing that Logan Paul does do is he shows a picture of Zach Kelling today and then a picture of him when he was younger. And it does look like it's the same guy. But then Logan Paul also shows a photo of the younger version of Zach Kelling in an orange jumpsuit. And that does seem to confirm, oh, hey, that looks like the same guy. It looks like the same guy is also in a jumpsuit at some point. This guy's definitely a felon. However, you only need to look at it for a little bit of time to realize that that photo of the younger Zach Kelling in a jumpsuit is actually the same photo of the younger Zach Kelling in a normal sort of outfit. And that that orange jumpsuit has actually been photoshopped onto him. I'm sorry, but to me personally, this felt very sneaky and manipulative, and it does ring a bell as to the accuracy of this information. And the thing is, if it does in fact turn out that Logan Paul is wrong on this one, 
This is highly defamatory. We're talking about defamation per se, where Zach wouldn't even need to prove damages. And what's more, because Zach is not a public figure, and because his participation in the series was as anonymously as possible, he requested anonymity, and so CoffeeZilla gave him the name Z instead of using his full name. He didn't physically appear with his face, or his voice was also distorted. All of these things indicate that he is not a public figure, he is a private figure, and so the analysis would be different than it is for Logan Paul. In other words, Zach would not have to show actual malice. All he would need to show is that Logan Paul was negligent in using his photo, using this information, and by making a misstatement about a potential criminal background of Zach Kelling. And the damages for this could be very, very high, not only because of the nature of the lies, but also because it was said by Logan Paul, which already is something that garners its own sort of exposure, but it's being said by Logan Paul in the midst of a controversy that is also generating a lot of internet attention. So all Zach would need to do is show that Logan lied about him and did so negligently. That is a much lower standard than actual malice. So like I said, for Logan's sake, I really do hope that he was right about the lead developer being a felon because otherwise you blew it. So yeah. Okay. There could be a number of reasons for Logan's sudden about face. It could just be because he saw that the public backlash was overwhelmingly against him on this issue. And maybe realized that people saw him as like the biff to coffee Zilla's Marty McFly. All right, punk. Now, whoa, whoa, Biff, what's that? It's like a little gnat. It's like a little fucking annoying gnat, and it bothers me. Or it could be that he had legal counsel giving him some very strong words about some of the repercussions of what he did in the last two videos. Or maybe both. Something tells me it was probably both. But what do you think? Let us know in the comments down below. Special thanks to the members of Bite Club, folks that are supporting us through YouTube memberships, supporters on Locals, and supporters on Patreon. We often cover a lot of different topics on this channel that YouTube does not particularly like to monetize, so support from you guys is always so, so helpful. And thank you to everyone else for watching. I hope you enjoyed this, or at least found it interesting or informative, and if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new here and you want to see more content like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next video. <laughs>